everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. The last study, uh, morning study of this week, dealing with Daniel's last vision. And um, we have a lot of things to cover still, but uh, we're going to do the best we can reading through Uriah Smith's document. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we invite your presence into our study uh, this morning. We're grateful for this opportunity once again to open your word together and to look at uh, the history of the understanding of Revelation 12, 13, and 17 in the context of Daniel's last vision. And Lord, uh, we know that there is much that we don't understand. We're fallible human beings. We make mistakes. We just ask for your guidance and that you can correct the errors we may have. We pray for those watching these videos, Lord. We ask that they can have an open heart and mind and that they can um, study prayerfully and carefully your word for themselves and um, that they can uh, continue uh, to respond to the light that you are giving them. Help each one of us to do so. Be with us now through the Holy Spirit to teach and guide us in this study. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so, uh, good morning again. This week has been a rather interesting study. So, last week we we sort of had a bit of a diversion, looking at some of the articles that uh, Jeff had been publishing, and um, uh, he has addressed uh, um, Revelation chapter twelve, which. I don't know if I'm going to get a chance to look at what he says about it here, um, but we know that he had addressed Revelation chapter 11 and had uh, Moses and Elijah slain um, on July 18, 2020, which seemed to me rather odd. And he does say some things about Revelation 12 that also uh, just seem to be out of the context of what uh, the chapter is talking about. Um, but right now we're looking at Uriah Smith's study on uh, Revelation uh, um, 12, 13, and 17. And we've looked at these arguments. So he's presenting the pioneer view, and he's using arguments that we don't see in the pioneers' writings. That is, the pioneers, at the time that they presented their arguments, they, they didn't have to go through such detail. But now, because there are new views being proposed, Uriah Smith is addressing that and trying to support the pioneer view. Now, in doing so, he, he creates some arguments that sort of are weak, right? So his, his whole way in which he approaches things is this polemic where he, he's just trying to win an argument, right? He's trying to, to win, to beat the other person. And so he misrepresents their views or shows the weakest aspects of their arguments, things that he can tear apart. He ignores the weak part of his arguments and only presents them in the most positive light, using sometimes rhetorical language um, to sort of belittle um, other people's views. Um, this one isn't as bad as some of his papers, where he can be very, very mocking, uh, especially when it comes to things like the state of the dead or this, you know, Sunday Sabbath issues. Uh, but here he's still using those same types of techniques, which is not, I think, I don't think it's something that's very Christ-like. Definitely, you're go not going to come to an understanding of the truth if you continually dig yourself into a position and um, really don't take an honest look at the problems that may exist with your understanding. So we are looking at these things openly and honestly, as objectively as humanly possible, but also uh, with the invitation of God's spirit to correct us. And we know that sometimes... In being corrected, we often need God's spirit to, to humble us, to make us meek enough that we can actually set aside pride and accept the truth. But we don't know the answers to a lot of these questions that we have. Um, so um, this last argument that we looked at had to do with this transition from pagan to papal Rome. And... Uh, the arguments that Uriah Smith is using is basically 
Pagan Rome has these seven heads. There's seven forms of Roman government. That's inconsistent with them being Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and Rome because Pagan Rome isn't Babylon, Media, Persia, or Greece. It's Pagan Rome. And yet we know that the next king, the next form of Roman government, uh, papal, the papal form, is expressed by the Beast of Revelation 13. And the Beast of Revelation 13 has the characteristics of uh, Greece, because it's a leopard-like beast, of Medo Persia, because of its feet, of a bear, and because and Babylon, because of the, lion, the mouth like a lion. And, and it's given power, seat, and great authority from pagan Rome. So it has all the characteristics of all of those. And so it would be consistent to say that the seven heads of that beast are Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, pagan, Rome, papal, and also the, the, the kingdoms following, such as the United States and the UN. That would be totally consistent, right? So he, he tries to make this argument that we can say is quite weak. Now, I do take the position, at least tentatively, that the pioneer view may be correct about Revelation chapter 12. That is, in Revelation chapter 12, it is consistent to take the seven forms of Roman government and apply them to the seven heads because those heads are different. They have crowns. Names of blasphemy are upon the heads of the beast of Revelation 13. The heads do not have crowns. Only the horns have crowns, 10 of them. And uh, so these are problems or de details that really need to be considered. Um, so any thoughts on that before we move forward? I know there's not as many people here today as there were yesterday. But um, hopefully that's a good summation. And mostly we've had like Stephen and Dwight sort of commenting on it and, and sometimes uh, some others commenting on it. But um, is anybody having a problem understanding this? I don't know if every Elvin, whether you were here, whether you watched the videos, you weren't here yesterday, but. So with what Uriah Smith is presenting, he's making an argument for the pioneer view that the seven heads are the seven forms of Roman government and each of the beasts, 12, 13, and 17, all the heads are always the same thing. And then he's arguing that the horns are always the same thing. Right, which he has as the 10 divisions of the Roman Empire, that is, it's the 10 divisions that are the result of the fall of Rome. Okay. But we, we don't, we don't hold the position that the 10 horns are always the same because we have the 10 horns being the United Nations, which are definitely not the 10 divisions of, of, of Europe. And, and so if we can have the horns represent something different in uh, um, Revelation 17, then, and really, if we're taking that they're all the kingdoms, that is, uh, one of the heads is also the UN. Um, it, it seems to me that there's there's problems with both of these extreme views. I'm saying extreme in the sense of not fanatical or anything, just extreme from each other. They're, they're very opposite views. Okay, so any questions? Maybe I jumped into it too quickly without as much review. But is everybody sort of satisfied with the summation there? Does that make sense to you? Okay. Okay. So here we're going to go into the next paragraph of Uriah Smith. He says, on this point, we have another evidence of the absurdity of applying the seven-headed and ten-horned dragon to the devil. Now, of course... You know, you can see he uses this language of absurdity, and sometimes we just do that. Um, but we can see that Ellen White says that the beast of Revelation 12 primarily represents Satan. So, and that's, that's the great red dragon. And Uriah Smith has quoted that. So it's primarily Satan, but it's in a secondary sense, 
uh, pagan Rome. So when he says the absurdity of applying the seven-headed and ten-horned dragon to the devil, for in this case, we would have the devil giving up his seat and his power to the papacy. Now, so do you see the problem with what he's trying to say here? So first, he's contradicting what the spirit of prophecy quote that he quoted earlier. And I'll, I'll just bring up that quote here in his document. Um, so. Look up that word. Yeah. So this is from the Great Controversy. Here's what Ellen White says. Um, the dragon is said to be Satan. He it was that moved upon Herod to put the Savior to death. But the chief agent of Satan in making war upon Christ and his people during the first centuries of the Christian era was the Roman Empire, in which paganism was the prevailing religion. Thus, while the dragon primarily represents Satan, it is, in a secondary sense, a symbol of pagan Rome. So to talk about the absurdity of something that Alan White has plainly stated and that he has quoted uh, doesn't really make much sense to me, right? Um, so we know that uh, it's only in a secondary sense, uh, pagan Rome. So it's primarily Satan. So you can't talk about it, the absurdity. Now, and he also uses here, um, he uses the word the devil, because once you use this word from... Um, a sort of uh, rhetorical sense. It would be quite different if he had put the word Satan there. Because Ellen White plainly says the word Satan, but he's going to put the word the devil, which gives a different in people's minds when you think of Satan or you think of the devil. The devil you think of much more as this uh, caricature of Satan, right? So, you know, so he's saying that this doesn't in any literal sense represent Satan, what he looks like or anything. Um, but Satan is the one behind this power. And we see this in when we go back to, um, so let's address this here. So if we go back to Daniel um, chapter 10, well, I'll just switch this here. So in Daniel chapter 10, remember, we have this, this vision. This is Daniel's last vision. And you're going to have this conflict between Michael, uh, one of the chief princes, and uh, the prince of the kingdom of Persia. Now, Persia is a kingdom, right? But the prince of the kingdom of Persia is not the king of Persia, right? We, we, we understand that? That this is Satan. Whoops. Sure did there. Okay. So this is, is Satan that is the prince of the kingdom of Persia. And Michael, of course, is uh, um, the chief prince or the uh, right, he's he's Michael, he's the archangel, right? He's the chief of all the angels or the heads of all the angels. And then it's going to talk about the prince of Persia, right? So in this case, this word prince, which in Hebrew is Sar, is not referring to the king of Persia or to the king of Greece, but to the power behind the throne, to Satan. So if we are going to say, as, as Ellen White plainly states, that in Revelation 12, that... Uh, this great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns um, uh, is primarily Satan, but in a secondary sense represents pagan Rome. I don't know how Uriah Smith can argue that it's absurd to say that it's a reference to Satan. Does that make sense to people? that he's, he's arguing against the quote that he gave. And I'm not sure why he does that. But he says, the absurdity of applying the seven-headed and ten-horned dragon to the devil, where Ellen White does, 
apply it to Satan. For in this case, we would have the devil giving up his seat and his power to the papacy. Now, this is not really what has to be seen, because does, in the way that he's taking it, does Satan transfer his seat, his power, and authority to the papal power? Does he remove that from uh, pagan Rome to papal Rome? Is Satan the one behind that? What would what would we say? Does Satan give the power, seat, and authority that was first to paganism? Does he then give that to the papacy? Because this is yeah. not about yeah because yeah. this is not about Satan abdicating. This is about Pagan Rome, of which Satan is the head, transferring this power, seat, and authority to papalism. And so it's not inconsistent with this beast representing Satan, as he quoted Ellen White as saying, that's primarily it's Satan, not even secondarily being Satan and primarily pagan Rome. Primarily, it's Satan. Secondarily, it's pagan Rome. So, again, very strange arguments that people can use when they're stuck in, in a sort of uh, polemic or dialectic. While he uses the papacy as his agent, it is certain that he still retains his place as the god of this world. And, of course, that would be the case. Right? The prince of the power of the air. Another quotation from the Great Controversy will make this point plain. Speaking of the leopard beast in Revelation 12, 13, it says, this symbol, as most Protestants have believed, represents the papacy, which succeeded to the power and seat and authority once possessed by the ancient Roman Empire. So again, that's not inconsistent with what Ellen White has said and not inconsistent with the idea that this beast represents Satan. But we need to also recognize that it is pagan Rome because Satan is the one using pagan Rome. He's also the one using papal Rome. So can we say in some ways that papal Rome is also a symbol of Satan working through the papacy? And we would have to say yes. So this dragon power, this leopard-like beast, and, and um, the scarlet colored beast are all showing Satan as the prince of this world operating through the kingdoms of this world. Okay, so it is said that Rome was the successor of all these governments and assimilated to itself the elements of them all. So this is the argument that I've made, right? And now he's gonna, for the first time, address that argument. They should be represented, they should be represented in in the Roman symbol, then we ask if such is not already the case independently of the heads, thus the papal beast has the body of a leopard, the successor of Grisha, the feet of a bear, reminding us of Persia, the mouth of the lion, characteristic of Babylon. Okay, so his argument is an odd one. So he's saying, because it's already represented in the body, we don't need it, or really he's saying, it can't be represented in the head. It's already done one way. We can't do it another way. Is this a good argument? Now, maybe I'm being a little bit polemical here. But is this does this make sense to argue that? That since yeah. the beast, the body's already composite? Yep. Okay. Not really. No. <laughs> it would actually be quite the opposite of argument. You would you would have the argument since the, it's already this beast. To make the heads, these successive powers would be completely consistent. But he's trying to use it as, use it as an argument against it. Now, in, in looking at what Uriah Smith is saying, I mean, the thing that I find in, in, in discussions that I have with other people about different things, different topics, these topics on the Internet, chronology and so forth, 
that this is almost a case study in how people can think, how they can support ideas um, in ways that really is not consistent with how we study the scriptures. Right. So this sort of argument, argumentative way in which he goes about it to show why he's right and why this new view can't be correct. Um, he's missing out on things that, that if he had spent the time to really consider, he could have had greater light, but he's not doing that. So if all these features represent all that needed to be represented in Rome, if it's relation to those preceding kingdoms, and do not these features, why should three of the seven heads of the beast be taken to represent the kingdoms also? Well, for the very reason that this beast represents these kingdoms, that's why the heads should also represent those kingdoms, right? So to say, if they do, then those kingdoms are represented twice over in that symbol. And we may be sure that prophecy is never guilty of such tautology. Now, he throws in the word tautology. Now, what's tautology? How would you define that word? I'm just going to see a good definition of it. So a tautology is the saying of the same thing twice in different words, generally to be considered a fault of style. Okay. So, so you, so is that the case? Would this be a tautology from a biblical sense? Do, don't we find that constantly we have two or three witnesses of something? Doesn't the Bible constantly use parallelisms? A repetition of saying the same thing in two different ways? Yes, we can, we can see that. So in a tautology, what you would do is you would say, I have two arguments for a position. And you say really just one argument, but you express it in a different way. That would be a tautology. In, in, according to that definition. But here, this is just consistent with what this beast is. It's a composite beast made up of these other kingdoms. And it's consistent that the heads then should be the heads, consist of the heads of that kingdom, plus all that, that kingdoms of the world are going to become. So it should be the complete representation of of the kingdoms of Bible prophecy. And so that's completely consistent. So such are some of the objections to going outside of the Roman Empire to find the seven heads or any of them. And they are sub submitted as conclusive evidence that we cannot go back of nor outside of the Roman Empire for any of the heads. So he hasn't given any conclusive conclusive evidence. Um, now, what we can argue is I do think because we looked at his argument for uh, Revelation 12, and definitely we have to go outside of pagan Rome to get the seventh head if it's going to be the papal form of Roman government. So it's completely consistent if we were going to make uh, those heads, you know, other things rather than just the Roman, uh, than uh, pagan, pagan Rome. But I do think that we need to look at Revelation 12 as being Rome, both uh, the pagan aspect of it, and then that final head, the seventh form of Roman government, uh, papalism, which really is just Christianized paganism. So I would think that it would be consistent to say that the seven heads in Revelation 12 are the seven forms of Roman government, but it would be inconsistent to argue that the seven heads in Revelation 13 are also the seven uh, forms of Roman government. Here, the argument that they're Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, etc., is consistent with the fact that one, it, it is the papal head or, or the papal beast, and that Revelation 12 is uh, 
pagan Rome, right? So you've got pagan Roman papal Rome. Uh, there's some overlap in them to some degree, but this is completely consistent with what we have um, here in the scriptures. And it's just never generally, people have never considered the idea that maybe the heads are different in each of the beasts, even though they have different aspects to them. So the seven heads in Revelation 12 have seven crowns, but in Revelation 13, they don't have crowns, but have the names of blasphemy. And in Revelation 17, it doesn't say anything about crowns or names of blasphemy on those heads. Right. It's going to talk about those heads in, in a sense of a progression. Five are fallen. One is and one is yet to come. But it doesn't make sense to apply those then to the heads of Revelation 12, of the beast of Revelation 12, or the beast of Revelation 13. So if those heads are the seven forms of Roman government in Revelation 17, or the same as the heads in Revelation 13, that still remains to be seen. But they may be something else that we've never considered. Though this movement is considering that those seven heads represent the presidents of the United States. And we've done that as a, an application, not as a direct prophecy. Right? But maybe there's some other way in which we can understand it. Okay, so he goes on that the, that portion of the view under the discussion, which applies to the present or the future, seems equally objectionable. Thus, the sixth head under which we understand the angel told John he was living is held to be the United Italy. So there's obviously different views that are going to be around. He says, in the new view, the seventh head is made to refer to a new kingdom of an unknown power yet to arise. Right. So. But we know that there was an unknown power yet to arise. And we definitely wouldn't put the sixth head as United Italy or anything like that. We know it's the United States if it's going to be uh, the kingdoms of Bible prophecy. Um, okay, so, um, so he's going to make some other arguments so we're going to skip here. Um, so part of the problem here is he's addressing a view that we don't quite hold and so it makes it a little bit um, but we can look at this one he says lastly we are told that the eighth head is the papacy restored it has already been noticed that the papacy in the new scheme constituted the fifth head so, so at least that would be consistent with the view we have but why should the simple restoration of this head constitute another head well, we could easily answer that question, right? Why would uh, this head constitute another head? Why would it be called the eighth? I mean, it's such a simple question to ask, answer. If the fifth head received the deadly wound, right? And this is the succession of these kingdoms, one to seven. And that head is resurrected, so to speak. In the, in the scheme of things, it would be considered the eighth, but it would be one of the seven, right? So when he asked that question, I mean, it's, it's rhetorical in his mind. He's not really asking anybody to answer it. And then he says, how much is intended by the expression of the papacy restored? We are not aware. So again, he just, he's minimizing the argument that he's, you know, the view that he's attacking. Um, and then he says, might it not be pertinent to inquire if the papacy ever is to be restored to be again a civil power, an event once spoken which one prophecy of the papacy has seen fit to notice is spoken of as taking away of his dominion, but the judgment shall sit and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it unto the end. Whether we take the last clause to mean the end of his dominion or the end of time, if the prophecy means anything, it means that after that dominion is taken away, 
whatever it is, the papacy never becomes repossessed of it again. Now, why is Uriah Smith holding this view? I think uh, maybe he's not uh, considering that, uh, first of all, maybe he wasn't understanding uh, what he was trying to put in place. Because uh, when you look at John, uh, Daniel, uh, Daniel is uh, seeing that the fourth piece was uh, different from these others. And the reason why it was different, it, it is because of the form it was made and how it is uh, conquering. It's not using uh, military strength. But again, in this power, we find that there's a combination of church and state. Okay. So, well, you know, I agree with what you're saying. Uh, now, with Uriah Smith and many Christians in that day in the United States, did they see a restoration of the papacy as possible? Did it seem to them something? Yes, I think. Uh, with the... No, it was not a common view. Um, the belief that the papacy would rise once again after it had been slain was one of the difficulties that Adventists had in putting forward their view regarding the Sabbath Sunday issue. The idea that the papacy would once again uh, be restored and that the American government would actually support the papis, papacy was seen as absurd. Now, to us as Seventh-day Adventists now, we, we kind of think, well, this is, this is a really common idea, but it just doesn't exist in this time, except among Seventh-day Adventists. People are not worried about the papacy. It's gone. It's finished. It's, it's insignificant in Bible prophecy, except Seventh-day Adventists say, no, that's not the case, right? So, so part of what I think is happening here is Uriah Smith is just appealing to the common sentiment that exists in his day. Because he's saying, um, uh, where was it here? Uh, yeah, but it might, might, might it not be pertinent to inquire if the papacy is ever to be restored, to be again a civil power? Right, and so then he shows how, no, this is not what's going to happen. At least that's how I read it. See, so whatever that dominion is, the papacy never becomes repossessed of it again. We are certainly past the time of the sitting of the judgment here brought to view, even if we apply it as late as 1844. We must, pa we must be past the taking away of the dominion, even if we apply that to the taking away of the temporal dominion in 1870, which Victor Emmanuel himself declared should never be restored to the papacy again. Now, has the papacy civil power been restored since the time of Ur Uriah Smith? I'll take it uh, 1922. The Lateran Treaty? Yes, because uh, we find that the, the purpose is being given, uh, given the, the Vatican, which simply means uh, it's been given the civil power. Yeah, it's been given its civil power back. So that has already happened now. So, so his argument against it never happening again uh, is a moot argument now. Um, because it has been given. Plus, even uh, we know the papacy has embassies, right? So that, that the kingdoms of this world recognize the papacy as a civil power, as a government. And, you know, presidents of the United States, when they become president, go and visit the Pope, and Trump did, right? And, and bow to the authority of the Pope. Right. So, so, so obviously this argument now looks kind of foolish. So, so the argument that the papacy is not going to be restored, it can't be the eighth head, 
Um, Uriah Smith is wrong, right? It definitely has been restored and will be restored even further at the Sunday law. And, and we can see that really by Revelation 13, the latter half dealing with the, the beast that rises up out of the earth. So, you know, when people take positions like Uriah Smith has and um, and try to make predictions upon it and not taking everything into account, they're going to be disappointed. Now, of course, Uriah Smith is going to die before all this, this happens, but, um, you know, this, this is the danger that we have, you know, in not considering everything. And this is really what these studies are about in, in what we're trying to do here, because we have a controversy that exists within this movement. And we could dig ourselves into our different positions and fight it out, or we can just look at the scriptures patiently and diligently and prayerfully go through them and find what it is we're missing. Right. So, you know, and you see it here again, Uriah Smith, with these insuperable objections. Now, when you throw words like insuperable into a sentence, why are you doing that? Why would he be using insuperable? Do we even know what that means? I mean, we kind of do. It means impossible to overcome. It's not something we use in everyday discourse. We, we don't talk about insuperable all the time. Yeah. Maybe in sports we talk about the insuperable odds, but I doubt people really actually use that word. But he uses it as a rhetorical device. That is, it's part of, by using big words, you sound like you know what you're talking about. So if you call the objections insuperable, you know, his objections are insuperable. They're impossible to overcome. Obviously, he must be right, you know. So, right? So he says, you know, we can't, I have all these insuperable objections to applying the heads anywhere outside of Rome. And they're definitely not insuperable. We've shown that they're not very good arguments. And, and against looking for any of them to come up in the future, right? Well, that's not a very good, he hasn't presented really any good arguments for this case that he's making. So he says, the question may still exist in some minds. Where shall we apply them? The old position remains that they denote seven distinct forms of government that have appeared in the Roman Empire. And now if it can be shown that such is actually the fact that seven forms of government have been there exhibited, will it not satisfy the prophecy most completely? Assuredly, it will. Now, of course, we know that we're supposed to be digging for script in the scriptures, for light, for things that um, that had not been revealed in the past. And so we know we need to go back to the foundation of Adventism, go back to Millerite history. But that doesn't mean that we just accept every interpretation that the pioneers made. We also don't take the opposite view where the pioneers were just, we can just ignore what they said, right? So I don't think you can just ignore the pioneer position. There. You can't just say, well, they were wrong about the seven forms of Roman government because I never heard of it before as a Seventh-day Adventist. And this other view just makes sense to me. So I'm just going to stick with it. Or, you know, this movement has taught that view. So we're just going to say that that's the case. I think that we we need to look back at what the pioneers taught, like we are doing now, and see, is there some light in it? And I think there is. I think it actually helps us to understand Revelation 12, 13, and 17 better. But we can see that the arguments that, that Smith is using will allow us to see the seven forms of Roman government in Revelation 12 as the seven heads. 
but the seven kingdoms of Bible prophecy, seven heads as representing Babylon, the University of Greece, and Rome in all of its phases, because I believe that the United States is a phase of Rome, as is the UN. Um, if that's the case, that will help us to understand Revelation 17, especially in the context of these seven kings and how we can relate that to the kings of Judah and to the kings of Persia. So, I mean, he's going to go through and show these seven forms of Roman government. They claim to have been named as follows, kings, consuls, decimers, decimers, dictators, triumvirs, emperors, and popes. Did these classes of rulers at different times appear as heads of the government? What is the head of the government? Is it not the whole nation itself? Uh, but that person, persons, it is not the whole nation itself, but the person, persons, or organization in whose hands is the supreme executive control of the government or nation. In the case of Rome, it will not be questioned that kings would properly constitute a head. The same would be true of emperors and the true of popes. But by common agreement, the papacy comes in as one of these heads. But by parity of reasoning, if the papacy was a head, these other classes of rulers must have been heads too. Therefore, we need to inquire only in reference to four of these, namely consuls, decimvers, dictators, and triumvirs. If we find that these acted such a part in the government that they could properly be called heads um, of the government, and that no other Roman officers did except kings, emperors, and popes already mentioned, then the whole ground is covered and the prophecy is fairly met. So um, I don't know if we need to go through the details of all this, um, but these are the different forms. So these are, are what Uriah Smith is putting forward. He's going to go through each of these. And, and we could look at them, but I think people could do this in their own time. It's not really going to be pertinent to uh, the arguments that we're making, because I think we definitely can, can do this. Um, but if people do have questions about it, if they go through this and say, well, you know, I don't know if I can do that. I don't, you know, maybe there's some other forms of governments. Uh, or other forms of Roman government that makes it more than seven, um, et cetera. Like sometimes people add the Republican form, right? So uh, there's different ways people name some of these things as well. Okay, I'm just slowly going through this here. Um, okay. <clears throat> Yeah, it says the kings and emperors were too near alike to constitute se two separate heads, but surely they could not be more alike than the papacy and the papacy restored, so, um, which are now to constitute two of the heads. Uh, kind of a silly argument there. But we, we know that it's a progression that's being shown. So there's seven forms of Roman government, and they happen progressively. And uh, so I, I think it's... He doesn't have to do some of the arguments that he's doing here. Um, okay, he says here, this view of the heads is not only confirmed, but practically demonstrated by the only other prophetic symbol in which a plurality of heads is presented, namely the four-headed leopard of Daniel 7. We are told that these four heads of the leopard were four distinct kingdoms, and therefore heads must always denote separate kingdoms. But let us inquire further as to the nature of these kingdoms. They were all Grecian kingdoms, for they were... Uh, simply divisions of the empire of Alexander, which was the kingdom of Grecia. The kingdom of Grecia is treated as a prophecy as a unit, right? So we can see that that these four heads are, and this is a good argument, um, are one government. So, so we could argue that the seven heads then must represent one kingdom. But we know it's already representing two different kingdoms, right? So when he makes this argument, he's he's sort of arguing against himself again, because if the papal head is a form of Roman government, but it's also a separate kingdom that is papal Rome. Now, you can say it's papal Rome and it's really the same kingdom, but because it is in a sense as well. But in a sense, all of these kingdoms are, are a continuum even though there are different nations that conquer each other. So, I mean, it is a good illustration that the leopard with the four heads, but we know that they separate into two separate kings or kingdoms, 
right? So you got the Seleucid and the Ptolemaic Empire. They're two separate empires. Sure, they are part of Greece. But, you know, different times they're not Greece, right? According to Uriah Smith, Turkey is, is the Ottoman Empire. It's, is it a Greek kingdom? You know, so so these types of arguments, they're, they're what I would call superficial arguments. They're not really the main thing that we would look at. Um, okay, so, okay, now remains to apply the facts herein briefly touched upon to the prophecy of the 17th chapter of Revelation. So now we're moving from Revelation 12 and 13 to Revelation 17. And in this, there will be no difficulty if we bear in mind and apply the principles which can be clearly deduced from the language of the prophecy itself. In the first place, the fact that it was one of the seven angels who had the seven last plagues that showed to John the judgment of great Babylon has no bearing upon the chronological standpoint from which John views the scenes he describes. For it was one of the same seven angels which showed him the holy city coming down from God out of heaven. But this is not till a thousand years after the same angels have poured out the vials of the judgment of God's wrath upon the earth. Okay, so he's just making an argument here about where you place this. Um, the angel himself acknowledges that there is a mystery connected with the symbols of the 17th chapter. For he says to John, I will tell thee the mystery of the woman, the mystery of the beast that carrieth her. Verse 7, we need not therefore be surprised if the rules of interpretation that can be adhered to in some other prophecies cannot be so rigidly followed here. Does this make any sense? What is Uriah Smith trying to state here? Do you accept this type of sentence here that he throws in? Can we can we say that just because there's a mystery connected with symbols, that that gives us leeway or license to follow different rules of interpretation? Is his sentence, as you just asked, is setting aside Miller's rules entirely? If you have some other system of interpretation that you're going to apply, what basis do you have to say that? I mean, what basis does he have to make this? Just because something's a mystery, that now we can we can apply different rules? We would actually, in, for a mystery, wouldn't we need to apply those rules rigorously that God has already given us? Wouldn't that be the key to understanding a mystery? I would agree. Okay. So, you know, when it comes to how we're studying, this is, this is one of the things, you know, I, I guess I'm a little bit bothered, you know, by, by how people study how people discuss and argue. You know, I'm not setting myself up above other people and I'm ultimately the, the best example because I make these mistakes too. Um, but we we have trained ourselves, you know, in this, this debate of style that you see here um, that Uriah Smith is using. And and what we should be doing is just trying to find the truth. Now, sometimes I'm accused as a debater. Like, I, you know, people say they don't want to debate with me. Um, but I'm not trying to win an argument. I'm just spending time analyzing things, trying to understand them. Now, I'm not saying that I've never got caught up in debate, because I have. I think we all have. Um, but, you know, then we're emotional to some degree. Debates become a bit more emotional. And 
so we need to think about this. Are we doing that? Are we claiming to follow rules uh, that we're not following? And, and especially, you know, Miller's last rule, which I think is the one that's the hardest for us to follow. Really just to have faith. And, and faith in the sense of trusting that God is in charge of all these things, that he doesn't really need us to uh, uh, police other people's thoughts. So, you know, so it, it's easy to start to find fault with somebody's argument and even to then attach it to the person themselves. And I, I don't think that we can do that. Okay, so there is a mystery here, but we're going to need to follow these rules more rigidly if we're going to come to an understanding of these things. Some things you can kind of know by intuition and and and, and they're things that have been understood for a long time. But when we have a controversy such as the one that exists in this movement, we're going to have to be careful about how we proceed. Okay. So he's going to go on. The compound symbol first presented, a beast and a woman seated upon it, is evidently designed to show the relation of the ecclesiastical to the civil power in the earthly government to be brought into view, or rather the distinction between them. The state dominated by the church as the horse is controlled by its rider. It is also to show the corrupt nature of that church, for it is generally agreed that the woman here as a symbol includes the papal church. Now, I would say the woman as a symbol, um, we could say includes the papal church because we say in its mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. Now, wouldn't that be the papal church itself? I mean, we know Babylon has three parts. The city of Babylon has three parts. But here, this Babylon that's a woman, wouldn't this be the Catholic Church itself? And the contrast here is to the woman of Revelation 12, which is another uh, point that we often ignore. So this woman must be the papal church, not just include the papal church. If it's the mother of harlots, correct? That would seem correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But and but we can agree with the idea that this is the church controlling the state. But more than that, I mean it's it's fornicating with the state. So the woman is fornicating with this beast, which is the state, the civil power. Um so it's controlling it in a specific type of way that's called fornication. But in other statements, this distinction, having once been clearly defined, seems to be dropped. The beast is considered as embracing the religious element also, for he is full of names of blasphemy, which is a religious characteristic. So, um, so if we go here to Revelation 17, we're going to look at these verses here. And... Before we go further with this reading. Okay, so let's look at Revelation 17 again a little more freshly. There came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials. So that's what he's referring to. So these are the angels that poured out the seven last plagues. Um, and talked with me saying, come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. And the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So the kings of the earth have committed fornication. So obviously the beast then has as well. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a colored, scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy. So we can see that what he's trying to say is that these names of blasphemy are upon this scarlet, scarlet colored beast. Now, what is blasphemy? What is this uh, Greek word referring to that's translated as blasphemy? Okay. 
So this means vilification, especially against God. So that's that's the Greek word there. Railing, evil speaking. Okay, so why does this scarlet colored beast that represents the kingdoms of this world, the civil power, why is it full of names of blasphemy? At the end of the world. What does it tell you about these kingdoms? That they're turning their back on God. Okay, so they're turning their back on God. Can we say that that's the case with the kingdoms of this world? It doesn't mean they're religious power, right? Because he's trying to say, because they're full of names of blasphemy, that the, the religious and uh, civil are mixed in the beast itself. Is that necessarily what it's trying to say with this beast being full of the names of blasphemy? I'm not sure I fully understand your question. Okay. So he's saying that the woman is the church, right? The Catholic church, the papacy, and that the beast represents the civil power. But here, it's not just the civil power. It's the civil power uh, mixed with ecclesiastical power because it's full of names of blasphemy. And so they're all placed into one. Right. You can say the names of blasphemy doesn't mean that this is a religious power in the sense like the papacy is. Because the kingdoms of this world have rejected God. They've reviled God. They're full of vilification of God. And that's all you need to be full of names of blasphemy. It doesn't mean that they have ecclesi ecclesiastical power all of their own. Right. Which is the argument he's making is that they're mixed together. Not that. Right. So. So I don't think that's a good argument based on that. Now, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of the abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. So we have these abominations, right, and her fornication. So the kings of the earth have committed fornication with this woman, right? That's who they, so the woman is a church, and this is the state that has committed fornication. That is the, the connection of church and state in this relationship is an unholy relationship. Right? It's, it's, it's contrary to God's word. So the church is in control of this relationship and the church is a woman. The state is represented by a man. In this case, a beast, but still. <clears throat> and upon her forehead was written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Right? And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. So we know this is the papacy. It's the persecutory power. For 1260 years. And then the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. Right? So we can see that they're distinct. There's a woman and the beast that carries her. And the beast that saw, saw, thou sawest, um, Um, the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. 
when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. So we're going to look at this later. But one of the things we talked about before is the beast here the same as this scarlet colored beast or is it referring back to an earlier beast? So that's, that's a question um, that we, we often don't ask. We just assume it's the same beast. But anyway, we're going to go back to Uriah Smith now that we've read this. We'll go back to what he's saying. Okay. <clears throat> the beast is of a scarlet color, the same color as the dragon, indicating that this beast covers Rome from the beginning of its history in its pagan form to the end of its career in its papal form, for it goes into perdition, the landing place of the papacy. Okay. So... So he's saying that because it's the same color as the beast in Revelation 12, um, that this beast covers Rome from the beginning of its career in its pagan form to the end of its career in its papal form. So he's going to say that this is, this beast is pagan in papal Rome, right? Is that what he's saying? That would seem to be what he's saying. Okay. Now, uh, on, um, now, I'm just looking at the charts here. So you're going to have, <coughs> um, in Revelation, you're going to have pagan Rome. You're going to have the, uh, the, you know, the seven-headed dragon. right? And then you're going to have uh, the leopard beast on the 1843 chart, which is uh, labeled as papal Rome. And then you're going to have the woman riding the beast and it says papal Rome. Now, now he's arguing that the beast itself is pagan in papal Rome. But we know that what's being represented in Revelation 17, that the woman represents papal Rome, controlling the kingdoms of this world. Right. But it's at the end of the world. It's at a certain time in Earth's history. Now, we know that it starts in 1798. Right. Because we're going to look at the end of that papal power. Um, so so there are some problems or things that we have to consider in in this context. But we're going to look at here. That's what Uriah Smith is saying. Basically, he's arguing that it's both pagan and papal um, Rome because it's the pagan form, the beginning with the history of the pagan form to the end of its career in its papal form. The verb to be in this prophecy uh, is sometimes used to express events to take place consecutively from a historical present. And again, it is used for the purpose of expressing great facts without reference to the time of their occurrence. Five are fallen, one is, the other is not yet come, right? So he says, this is spoken concerning seven heads, which were to appear in consecutive order. And as there is no intimation of any arbitrary point of view from which the reckoning is to be made, it would mean nothing at all unless calculated from John's own day. So we run back into that argument about the timing. When is the explanation given? Is it given in John's day? That is, is it from the perspective of John's day? We know where the vision is in the future. But the question is, is the explanation to be counted from when John is living or from when John is in vision? Right. So that's one of the big issues regarding the timing of, of how to look at five or fallen. One is. OK. And he's saying this word, the verb to be, which is the one is the one to be. In this prophecy is sometimes used to express events to take place consecutively from a historical present. Present, so that means uh, historical present. That's going to happen. Um, let me see here, because to be means is the same as five are followed. One is right. Now he says the word, the verb to be. Now, now if we were to say one is to be, 
That's different than saying one is. So I'm, I'm not really sure how he's seen this. He's not really making it really clear. So um, he's just saying that you can talk about something as is without reference to the time of its occurrence, it's just something that's going to happen. Okay, so he goes on. Um, so he says this would mean nothing at all unless calculated from John's own day. Well, is that true that it wouldn't mean nothing at all unless calculated from John's own day? So he's saying five have fallen, one is. One's yet to come. And when it continues, it must continue a short state. Okay, so so this is this is how he's he's looking at this. Does this make sense that it would mean nothing unless calculated from John's own day? I, I don't think that that you can say that, right? Because it could be calculated from some other place. Okay, let's go to Daniel chapter 8. Okay, so in Daniel chapter 8, um, we have a prophecy. And in this prophecy, we're going to have Daniel in vision. He's going to see all kinds of things happening, right? Um and in prophecy, a host was given him against the daily sacrifice, daily, by reason of transgression. It cast down the truth to the ground. It practiced and prospered. And we know he's talking of the future, right? But he speaks in the sense of a present, sen present tense or an incomplete tense, right, when he's having a vision. But then you're going to have an explanation. Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint, which spake, How long shall it be the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation, to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said unto me, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Where are we going to count the 2,300 days from? Are we going to count it? Yeah, are we going to count it from Daniel's time? No. No, right. So now Daniel in vision is brought to the period of the Medo Persian kingdom, right? He's in the time of Babylon. He's going to be brought to Shushan the palace, uh, possibly in 457 BC, is where he's going to be brought to. And so the count of the 2300 days is going to be given not from where he is in history, but from where he is brought to. In prophecy. Right. So here we have a an example of how uh, the angel can tell him. Basically, now when you say under 2,300 days, I mean, he doesn't know the starting point yet because he's puzzled about it. And he's also puzzled about the length of it because he understands it to be 2,300 years. But he's not going to be given the starting point as such until Daniel chapter nine, right? So definitely the starting point's not in his day. He knows he can interpret at least from the vision that it's in the time of the Persian kingdom, which hasn't happened yet. So he's not really going to fully understand this till later. Um, so he's not going to be um, having these problems because we know he writes the book of Daniel as when he's older. So he doesn't write these all out and send them out as, he has the visions. He puts them together in a book, and then that book is sent out later. People might know about his visions to some degree, but the book of Daniel is put together at the end of Daniel's life. So, um, and that's how he would know he was in Shushan the palace here, um, because, you know, there's disagreement about whether this term Shushan the palace can even be meaningful until the time of Darius, that is in the time of um, Belshazzar under Nabonidus's reign. Um, 
some other night is, you know, uh, I always get the guy's names mixed up. Yeah, Nabonidus, uh, uh, his uncle there. Um, so, so this this he's brought into the future, sometime way into the future. So this even be before Nabonidus. This would be earlier. But anyway, uh, the point is, we can see that there is a precedent for talking about a prophecy from the perspective of where the prophet is brought to and not from where the prophet was living at the time, the time in which he was living. Can we, can we see that that's the case here? Yes. Okay. So, so wherever this explanation is, we could, we have three different options. We can say, that the five of fallen one is, is from the perspective of John's day. And that's possible, right? I mean, it's possible that that's where we could be counting from. We could also say it's from 1798. Um, but if we understand this beast in some other way, and we understand these heads in some other way, other than the kingdoms of this world, or other than the forms of Roman government, um, it may have some significance it might be sometime even in the future from us where it said five are fallen, or it might even be in the time in which we're living where we could say five are fallen, one is, right? So we haven't come to a conclusion on that. All we're saying is that some of these arguments that are being brought up by Uriah Smith can easily be shown to be faulty arguments. That is, they're not proof of his position. Okay. So, um, okay, so when it says here, uh, see illustrations of this in the following expressions. Five are fallen and one is, the other is not yet come. This is spoken concerning seven heads which were to appear in consecutive order. And as there's no intimation of any arbitrary point of view from which the reckoning is to be made, it would mean nothing at all unless calculated from John's own day. So we're saying that's not the case. And then it would clearly mean that John was living in the time of the sixth head, five having passed away before his day, and that two more were to appear after that, under which John was living, had completed its period. But here is another expression that cannot be applied in this way, namely, the beast that was and is not and yet is. Um, now, a beast cannot be in a condition expressed by the words is not and is at the same time. That is, he cannot be and not be at one in the same instant. But it will be said that it means is not and shall be. Very true. But that is the comment and explanation and not a translation. And we are now speaking only of the language and its use. We have another instance in this expression, and the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth. It could not be the said of this beast that he is not, and at the same time that he is the eighth head. These expressions must therefore be understood as simply setting forth the great fact that this beast would for a time exist and then seem to disappear or cease to exist, and then appear to, again in an active living condition without any reference to the time when these changes should occur. So I don't know if you follow his argument there. He needs to take a course on uh, writing so that he can communicate his ideas better. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Um, I'm gonna get rid of the Greek numbers here just to make it cleaner. Okay, the beast that thou sawest was and is not. Okay, what does that mean? The way that I see it, it's uh, the beast uh, existed. Now it's yeah. not existing. Yes. Right. And we also see that this is, this language is used in contrast to the language about Christ, which him, which is, which was, and which is to come. Notice he always... He was, he is, right? You can never say that Jesus is not, right? Because God is eternal. 
And right. so this language here is shown in contradistinction to that, that language. It's showing that this, this beast is anti-Christian in that way. It's an anti-Christ type of power. Okay. And then it says, he shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. Right. Well, and go into perdition. So this is going to be dealing with um, this beast is going to ascend out of the bottomless pit. Now, in some ways, we, we said that the dragon, the great red dragon in Revelation 12 is primarily a symbol of Satan, but also in a secondary sense represents uh, pagan Rome, right? And we can see here that this power, then this beast is a satanic power ascending out of the bottomless pit. That this, this, these kingdoms of this world, this that, that the woman is riding, that has committed fornication with uh, this beast, the beast has committed fornication with the woman, um, is a satanic power. Right? That means it's a power of the world. Satan is the prince of this world. Now, so whatever this beast is, though, is it the beast that we just saw here, or is it what's called the first beast in Revelation 13? Now, just before we answer that question, one of the things that we see about the book of Revelation that I don't know if people are aware of is that there's 22 chapters, and those two, 22 chapters are in God's providence, and it's divided up into 11 chapters the first 11 chapters address the seven churches, the seven seals, um, uh, and the seven trumpets, right? And, and those are going to end with, in chapter 11, the seventh trumpet, right? It's going to end that. And then when we get to the second half of the book of Revelation, things are different. That is... It's really a completely different way of looking at this history, right? It's going to go not so much all the way back, though it does. It's going to go back to Revelation 12, right? So it's going to go back and, and cover this history that was covered before. But it's going to look at it in a different way. It's not going to be, you know, the seven churches or the seven seals or the seven trumpets. It's going to be addressing this with these beasts, Right. So this whole section is addressing this beast. Now, you know, we can say, well, 14, 15 and 16 don't have beasts in them. But these are a continuation of a series of prophecies. First, you're going to have these two beasts represented. Right. Period of pagan Rome, the period of papal Rome. And then you're going to have the hundred and forty four thousand introduced with the message of the three angels message. So Millerite history. Right. And then. This is going to bring us all, all the way through uh, 15, 16, 17 to the plagues, right? We're going to see these plagues poured out. And, and so these plagues, what is the purpose? Why are these plagues placed in this sort of 14, 15, 16, going to the end of the world? And then why do we come back to 17 and 18 and so forth? Why, why do we go back like that? So why does, why does chapter 14, 15, and 16 exist between the Beast of Revelation 13 and the Beast of Revelation 17? Why does it bring us all the way up to the seven last plagues and then go to back to the Beast of Revelation 17, which are definitely uh, before the seven last plagues are poured out? Well, I think uh, Revelation chapter... Uh, 14 is a warning for the plagues which are coming and uh, when, when we see the plagues we find that uh, the warning was uh, uh, directed to the beast which is coming in uh, 17. That's how I see it myself. Okay, yeah so that's a very reasonable way to look at it. So we have the beast of Revelation 13 we're brought to 1798 we're going to be now Remember, we have already covered Millerite history in uh, chapter 10. And then in chapter 11, we're going to, because if you go back and look at these chapters, 
where chapter 10 is going to be uh, this Millerite history, the disappointment. And chapter 11 is then going to uh, deal with the end of that period of the 1260 and then go into the seventh trumpet, which is going to begin to sound October 22nd, 1844, right? So, so that's all of that first part of Revelation. But now in 12, it's going to introduce, instead of, it's going to have the seven last plagues. So it's going to have some things dealing with seven. But the primary uh, element here is these beasts. And so it's going to be tying us back to the book of Daniel with the symbols of these beasts. And it's going to cover, again, that history that was covered in the first part. But it's going to cover it differently with these beasts. And then when we get Revelation 14, um, so when when we get to this here, it's going to bring us in Revelation 13 to the Sunday law, right? That they may not buy or sell. Hmm. So it's going to bring us to the mark of the beast, right? So it's going to bring us up to the Sunday law. And then it's going to introduce the 144,000 at the Sunday law. But then it's going to go back to the three angels' messages, right? So this part of 14 is it's going to address the three angels' messages that are going. So it's, it's kind of a repeat and enlarge, right? It's a common thing in Hebrew prophecy. And then it's going to bring us all the way to the harvest of the earth. So it's going to show these two contrasting things, uh, the 144,000, the message that brings about the 144,000. And then, of course, the harvest of the earth, which is the harvest uh, dealing with uh, first God's people that are harvested from the earth. And then, of course, the wicked, right, that are going to be tread down in chapter 15. We're then going to see the seven last plagues, the angels of the seven last plagues. It's a fairly short uh, section, and it's going to bring us the temple was filled with the glory of God and from his power. Right. So it's going to talk about uh, the temple here. So it came out of the temple. So there's things here that relate uh, to the close of the judgment. And then the seven last plagues being poured out. Right. So it's covering this history, all this warning. Uh, that's be but really it's covering the 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 messages and and the result of those messages so so it just keeps repeating that history so then when it goes back to revelation 17 what we have to question is well, where is this you know what period of time is this that he's actually brought to now we know that he's carried away into the spirit in the wilderness. And he sees the papal, the woman, the papacy, riding this scarlet covered beast. So we know that it's bringing us to the end of that period. And how do we know it's to the end of that period and beyond? So what, what, is, what are the keys here of where we place it? Because somebody could just say, well, it's brought into the spirit of a woman or the spirit of, in the wilderness and this is just during the 1260 years that this beast exists. It's just describing the period of the papacy. It's not addressing, you know, the end of 1798 or the end of the world. But how can we know uh, where we place this? Because this is part of the argument that Uriah Smith is saying. Just because there's these seven angels with these seven last plagues doesn't mean that doesn't help us place it anywhere. So he says, we're going to place this. As something that's going to be future from from John's day, and that um, that he's going to count these heads five are falling one in. So John is is going to be in the time of Imperial Rome, and that's why this head, the seventh head, is the seventh form of Roman government. But what are keys that can tell us where this is, when this is? I guess I should say. So Stephen brought out in verse six, I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. So he says it must have been after this persecution has occurred. 
What else? The part about the sauce was, is not in shell ascent of the bottomless pit. So in, when we look at this verse, if this beast is the kingdoms of this earth, the civil power that's being talked about, if it's the, the great, uh, um, the scarlet colored beast, right? And, and we're almost out of time here. So this is what I want you to consider. This is an assignment for, because on Sunday we're gonna, we're gonna come back and address this point because we have always placed this at 1798, Revelation 17, just as we do with Revelation 13. But the question is, how? what keys are there to show us when this is? That's what we need to, to ask ourselves. When is this? When is John being brought to? And why would we give that position that that's when he's brought to? And that if we find out when he's brought to, could we argue that the five are fallen must be seen from where he's brought to? And not from when he was, when he was given the vision. Okay. So that's, that's the assignment. We've got to figure this out. Any questions or comments? Okay. Well, let's close with prayer. Uh, dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the study today and for each person who has participated. The more we study your word, the more we realize how little we understand and um, how many assumptions that we have made. We know, Lord, that you wish to correct the errors that we hold in our understanding because these things apply now to our present time and we need this light for our feet. So we pray for this movement, for the truths that um, you have revealed that they can be made clear uh, to those searching for truth and that we can be corrected of our errors. Be with us through the rest of this week or study tomorrow night and for Sabbath morning. And we ask this and we pray in Jesus' name.